Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Those that have come before, welcome. Those that haven't come before, we welcome you also. Uh, your, the next 60 minutes, or will I say 55 minutes, will be very useful to you. Um, especially if you have a side hustle or if you have a, a side business that you're running. Uh, my guest tonight is um, an experienced uh, lawyer. She's uh, well known, and uh, I promise not to talk about uh, my relationship with her in my personal capacity today. <laughs> so let me just go official because uh, she may think I'm just uh, blowing her trumpet. But uh, let me just say something I've dealt with lawyers in different countries, and Madam Florence, you stand out. You know, my husband and I will say that to you any day, any time. Uh, she's a person of integrity and uh, she keeps her word. She's very professional. Um, she will give you the best. You, you, you don't uh, have any worries when you have um, legal things to, that she has to handle for you. Uh, thank you, Madam Florence. It's been a while I've been trying to bring you to this program. And thank you for your time. I know you are quite, um, you are quite thank busy. You. So this evening, we are going to be talking about uh, word preservation, estate planning, and business uh, protection. I think we will spend more time on the business area because uh, my experience with the people that um, I mentor and I talk to is that most people are a bit careless with, their, with the legal structure around their businesses, and I wanted you to really deal with that this evening. Uh, please, as we progress, you can put your questions in the question box. Hey, Angie, good to see you. Um, Put your uh, questions in the question box so that uh, if we don't deal with your question as part of what we, the questions we had put up before, then we can get to your question later. Um, I'm going to, she's going to start off by maybe spending five minutes to talk about the topic, but before then, I just wanted to tell you people a little bit more about her, a little bit more other than that she's a professional to the core, um, and she's quite um, affordable. Should I put that? <laughs> well, that's, you can. <laughs> that's, that's right? <laughs> Let me not put that on the table. Okay, okay. so uh, Florence is a partner with Alliant uh, Conrad Lawrence, uh, Nigeria, member uh, of the Alliance Group. is an international law firm providing a comprehensive range of legal services to businesses. Florence is well experienced in the provision of legal services to individuals and corporates of all sizes. Her work spans business formation, restructuring, corporate governance, business rescue and insolvency, intellectual property, wealth management, and estate planning. In addition to her work as a lawyer, Florence sits on the board of several private companies, and she acts as a trustee and volunteer legal advisor to some not-for-profit organizations. Uh, she's a member of the Nigeria Bar Association, Intellectual Property Law Association of Nigeria, and International Trademark Association. There's so much more, but if you're following my page, then you would have seen... Um, thank you, Admiral Kamalafe, for joining us. You would have seen um, her profile. I put her profile on the page earlier on. Ah, Madam Florence, over to you. Okay. Good, good evening, everyone. Okay. Good evening, everyone. And um, BK, thank you for, for having me. And um, is it an honor to start the conversation this evening? Um, not much to say in terms of recap because, um, like BK noted, the conversation today is going to revolve around uh, more of an interactive um, session, starting with her. And for those of us that have been following BK and her activities, finance coach, in the past years, you understand her passion, not just for wealth creation, but wealth preservation, wealth management, and also her passion for estate planning. Thinking about, we all this, um, put a lot of things together in our lifetime, and are we doing it right? Not just for the present, but in terms of when we come uh, incapacitated or when we are no longer here. But like you say, today's, um, this course will be more on the business aspect of it because she's also concerned about um, the ability of businesses to assess necessary benefits resulting from setting up the right structure around their businesses. So we are going to be hearing a bit about business formation, 
right business structures and delving into a bit of estate planning in terms of what happens where a business owner is not able to do certain things uh, um, because of incapacitation or other circumstances. And um, like I said, and, and BK noted, the conversation is going to revolve around um, interactive um, discourse, question and answer. So BK, I think I pass the button over to you to take it yes, from there. Thank you so much. Uh, because we don't have much time, we'll try and um, deal with as many questions as we can. But if there are questions beyond what we're talking about this evening, uh, please feel free to send us an email. Send an email to financecoachtoday at gmail.com. Or just slide into my, uh, d just send me a DM, slide into my uh, profile and then send your question directly. Okay, thank you, Florence. Um, you also know that uh, one of the reasons why I decided to put this uh, session together uh, is because of some personal, well, I put it, personal experience that I've had with very close people uh, on how they've um, dealt with you know, their, their legal structure around their businesses and the unfortunate outcome uh, that has come out of that. Uh, so the first question I have for you today is... Um, how can I put a good business structure around my side hustle? How can I set up the right legal structure for my business? What are the key steps to take for this? You know, so many people are doing businesses in their, you know, some of them, one room in their, in their houses, uh, and they're doing very well, making profits, you know. Uh, they're making money that they're using to, to fund their, uh, their family expenses and all of that. But there's no legal structure. Uh, and they're quite exposed. So the question is, what are the key steps to take towards putting um, legal structure around my a business, no matter the size? Okay, uh, thank you. L like you noted, anybody can pick up a business line, a product line, and say, I'm doing business, and you're making profit in your little corner. But long term, are you positioned for the full benefit? And that is where having the right um, structure comes in. And having the right business structure does not start from, I want to register my company. And generally for us, when you come in and you say you want to register a business, the first thing is, let's sit down and have a discussion. What business are you going into? What do you know about the business? So it starts from everything about information gathering about the business um, your business plan, because that will now inform the decision on the type of business, legal business structure to, to adopt. In that case, you have to meet, um, it may be possible some legal advisors or even financial advisors, sit down and discuss with them, this is what I want to do. Um, what should I expect, even post-registration, post-setup? What are the tax implications? What are the risks I should be looking at? What are the compliance issues, regulatory issues I should be thinking of? Am I looking at a small business in the corner of my room as a sole owner that everything revolves around me? The structure will be different. Am I looking at a business um, structure that involves two, three persons coming together? The structure will be different. So having said that, um, we have about three business um, legal structures. You have the business name or the sole proprietorship. Business name is, is it's when you, allow, if you decide to register a pseudonym instead of your name. If not, you can actually carry on business in your name as a sole business owner. And for business name, it's easy to set up either as a sole proprietor or in partnership with some other persons. The cost is very low. But in terms of assessing um, growth benefits, expansion strategies, will that take you to the next level you are looking at? Um, in terms of funding, uh, funding for, for, for capital, attracting investors, will that take you to the next level? And then you have another structure. Partnership is another way of looking at it. One to two friends or family members coming together to say, okay, do you know what? We want to do this business, make money out of it, and split. 
you have a partnership agreement. Um, you can register as a business name as well, having more than one proprietor. That is a um, multiple proprietorship business name now. And for some states, like Lagos State, it's a requirement that you register some um, partnership um, relationship with the state. Again, like um, the sole proprietorship or business name proper, it's easy to set up. The cost is low. And maybe in terms of capital investment, growth strategy, you may be able to leverage on the fact that you have more than one person providing their credit profile to assess funds. But again, um, it's still not there because in terms of long-term strategy, business growth, the, the limitation is still there. Because in terms of liability, again, I must say, for a business name or a sole proprietorship partnership, liability is tied to the individual. You are not hedged against risk. If anybody is coming or you, you, you have um, a liability issues, you can be attacked directly. Your finances, your assets can be attached directly because everything revolves around you. There's no separation between um, the business and yourself. So if I'm coming after you for a claim, I can as well attach your business account and get whatever I want to get. It applies for both partnerships and um, business name. For limited liability companies, it's more, it's more structured in that you, you are required to have um, shareholders. Um, luckily, we now have a one shareholder provision in the Companies Act, the, our new companies, um, Kama 2022, 2020, I mean, where it is now possible to register as a sole shareholder sole director limited liability company. In the past, it used to be a minimum of two directors, two shareholders throughout the lifespan of the company. But now you can register with just a shareholder and a director. So whether as a sole shareholder, a sole director, or multiple shareholding entity as a limited liability company, it positions you for further, for more benefits you are able to assess funding. Investors will see the structure as a more reliable one, reputable entity to deal with. Um, your liability is separated from the business. For example, if, if, you, if, you, if you are operating a limited liability company and you have a claim against you, um, the person bringing the claim cannot attach the shares of the company or the company's account because the business is separate from you. Your own um, interest in the business is limited to your unit share in the business. And in terms of um, tax liability again, um, for a sole sh um, proprietorship business name or partnership, that may be a bit favorable because um, the tax liability rests on just the partners, the business owners, the sole proprietor. So you have one tax um, liability stream. There's no income tax. For limited liability company, you have a dual um, income tax structure. The business pays the company income tax and the individual shareholders are liable for personal income tax on the income derived from that business. Yeah. Uh, so having said let me, that, let me let me stop you there, Florence, because um, I want you to um, I hear you very well because um, you've given us uh, some of the things that uh, we should do first, and then you went on to talk about the different types of um, legal structures that are possible. Um, I yeah. hear you say that before we even start talking about legal structures, we should first of all understand the business we want to go into. Uh, you know, we should understand, we should, you know, carry out a feasibility study, understand the risks that are involved, the compliance requirements and, you know, uh, and, and the tax uh, um, requirements as well. Uh, then you went into telling us the types of uh, legal structures that we can have. Um, and I'm, I'm trying not for you not to be too, you know, you're the guru here. Uh, 
so that you're not too much too fast for us and you don't lose us okay as we, yeah so that that's what i'm trying to i'm trying to okay. keep, you know, slow you down a little bit so that you can come to our level and um carry us along so if we, if we go back to the question so the key steps would be for my followers to know the kind of business they want to go into they should first of all do you know you talked about the um feasibility yes, study they should, they, they should do their research they should understand what they really want to do and then you also went on also to talk about where they want to take the business to down the road i guess that's why you were now explaining that we could go uh, different types uh, the yes. way of limited liability uh, companies if you wanted to really grow it to be very big um I, again, because I have so many questions, I don't want you to spend too much time on that one. Okay. 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 Um, having touched on the types of um, legal structures, the type uh, can I go on? Yeah. Okay. Can I go on? Please go on. Okay. Please having go touched on the type of um, legal structures and the benefits and maybe the disadvantages around them, um, you now proceed to, like I said, in all of this, you are discussing with your advisor. You proceed to identify the type of legal entity, legal structure you want to adopt. So you get a name for your business and you proceed to registration. Now, post-registration, that is where the real um, journey starts. You have to ensure that you are compliant with all the regulatory requirements. And that will flow from the previous conversations around what you should expect, look at the type of business, um, the issues you should be looking at. A mandate really, you are expected to register with the um, FIRS for income tax remittance and VAT. And for businesses, business names, the, something that um, business names are exempted or they are not required to, they don't have anything to do with FIRS. They do, because you have to remit VAT. You are expected to remit VAT on behalf of um, the customers to the government. And even for income the business is generating, they are liable to withholding tax as well. So you have to register with FIRS, the respective inland and state inland revenue service and some other local government and um, registration requirements that may apply to the business. You have to get your business permit. So you are on the right footing. Then you start running the business. You have to focus on your accounting, your record keeping, ensuring annual or yeah, annual audit of your books. Because when it comes to assessing funds, as some of us are aware, the, the investors or financiers who want to look at your books, and if the books are not tidy, you are at a disadvantage. So beyond registration, it's because for some of us, we think, oh, I've registered and that is it. I have a document to run with. But you have all of that to deal with to be sure that you are on track. Then you, from time to time, review your business management strategies, your processes, you need to have good processes and procedures for every aspect of the business if you have to run it well. That's okay, who sorry, at least... I have to ask you a question before you go on. Um, okay. I have to ask you, you mentioned the um, registration uh, being positioned for the tax um, compliance, uh, FIRS and uh, the VAT registrations. Um, so... Who should my followers go to? Who should help them with this? Would this be the, the lawyer that is trying to help them uh, put the legal structure together? Or do they have to go to tax consultants? Or who will handle this registration for them? Is it part of the putting the company together? Or they do this, they register the company with lawyers and then they look for tax experts to do this? Is it something lawyers do? Uh, lawyers manage the tax registration as well, even though it's supposed to be within the purview of... Um, the tax advisors. But um, for registration, and again, for some of us, it's part of the package when we say we are setting up the business from advisory through registration to making sure that you are registered with um, the federal inland revenue for your income tax remittance and VAT. 
So you can either that go to the tax advisor or the lawyer that assisted with the registration, even if the lawyer is going to bill separately for it, just make sure it is done. That's the most important thing. And if you have in-house capacity to manage that process for you, fine. Okay. Uh, I have a question already, but um, I'm going to come to it later. So um, quickly, so you try to explain to us now uh, the steps, the things we should focus on um, when we're trying to put a legal structure around our businesses. Um, there's one question. You've already started talking about the benefits of having a legal structure around the business. But can you just quickly maybe give us an estimate of um, what it costs to incorporate um, um, a business or something? You don't, you know. Uh, okay. <laughs> just give us an idea. Maybe no, 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 it's okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, the cost of registering or incorporating a business depends on the type of business. For a business name, I can, for example, give you an idea um, of an official cost because it's there on the CSC portal. It's 10,000 Naira filing fees. 10,000 Naira for business name. That is official filing fees, registration fee for business name. But that is um, exclusive of professional fees that may apply exactly. and that varies. It's not fixed. Okay. Okay. That varies. Um, for limited liability companies, the filing fee, as of today, you have for the first one million naira from one hundred to one million um, naira share capital is five five thousand naira. Then subsequent, no ten thousand naira for the first. Subsequent one uh, millions attracts five thousand naira. So, for example, if you are incorporating a company of 10 million naira, it is calculated, the CSC filing fee is calculated at 5,000 naira for the first 1 million, and the subsequent million will be, 1 million will be 5,000 naira. So, you are looking at roughly about 55,000 naira to incorporate, is it 55? Yeah, 55,000 naira to incorporate a 10 million naira share capital. That is the official fee. That is exclusive of stamp duties that is calculated at one naira fifty kobo for every two hundred naira um, of share capital. Uh, so, for example, if you are looking at um, a share capital of one million naira, that's roughly about is it um, seven thousand five hundred? Uh, memorandum and articles of station stamping is about 500 naira per copy. If I'm stamping, stamping to that's about 1,000 1, naira. So that's roughly the official fees, exclusive of professional fees and other expenses, incidental costs that may apply. So, and um, for the professional fee, it's not fixed. It depends on the firm handling it. Yeah and the extent of um, yeah. whatever yeah. services yeah. they are rendering. All of that. Okay. Um, so, with as small as 10,000 Naira, that's without, um, without the professional fees. One can register a business name. Okay. I, I think what I would just say to the followers is, if you have an idea of the kind of business you want to register, drop me a line and I can get you... Um, the specifics uh, of what it will cost you because uh, now we we'll need to start calculating for the different uh, level uh, share capital that your business, different businesses may get to in order to understand. But I just wanted to put it out there that it's not so expensive, right? Florence, am I right? It's not, it's not going to kill anybody. It's not money that it, it doesn't. And yeah. many people don't know that. And that's one of the reasons we're having this uh, conversation. Many people don't know that it's not that expensive. For example, business name. No, many people don't know. Um, they think that maybe you need millions to incorporate or you need millions to register a business name. Um, I'm going to have to rush to another question. One, one of the um, objectives of this session is to get people to ask more questions. Uh, they really might not get all the answers in this session, but we want you to, be, uh, to come out of your comfort zone to ask questions. And uh, financial education is something that we continue to get. It's, it's a continuous thing. Today, you may know, what you, you may know everything about um, budgeting. Uh, tomorrow, you need to learn and know about, uh, sorry, we're in Nigeria. Nepal is the, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're 
<laughs> but you will come on. <laughs> you will come on soon. Uh, so um, we're going to ask more questions. It's we may not have answers to everything, um, but um, these conversations will get people to come out of their comfort zone and ask and get more knowledgeable about things around them. Ah, uh, excuse me. Okay, Florence, while I try to sort out light here, uh, you already talked about the benefits of having a legal structure. Uh, then I have this question. I get this question, uh, this kind of question a lot. I've started my business and I don't have a structure. What can I do? Can I still, can I in the middle of it, you know, put a structure around it, Florence? There's many people in that uh, situation right now. So many of my followers, they're running businesses and they don't have a, uh, legal structure. Is it too late? Were they supposed to have done this before? Um, it's, it's never late. Um, just that um, you may find that by the time you are trying to put that structure, if you're thinking of something like a brand identity, a brand name, mm -hmm. by the time you are getting around to doing that, that name may no longer be available. The brand may no longer be available. And you Thank now you. have to go back to the drawing board because you have situations where people just sit in their homes and um, just um, put together later heads of the name they want to use and they start doing business, uh, supplies and all of that. And by the time yeah. they get around to realizing that I should register this name, they go to Corporate oh, Affairs Commission you. and discover oh. that the name is not there. Um, they go to the trademark registry, they want to register that logo, that brand, and it's taken. It's no longer there. Mm -hmm. So it's never too late. And when it happens, it's just, it, yeah. it just, we should just see how we can work around it, rebrand okay, and take up. I hear you mm. clearly, Florence. You're saying it's never too late, but there are disadvantages yes. of waiting. Uh, the yeah. disadvantages of waiting, your, your preferred business name might have been taken, your logo might have been taken and all of that. There are so many questions for you. And you know you are hard to get. So let me just run quickly to... <laughs> Um, okay, you've answered this one. I've been running my business for years, but I have no corporate identity. Is it too late? You say it's not too late. That's what you told us. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. you answered this already, but maybe you just want to uh, provide a response just to this particular question because you answered it in the midst of you know explaining the type of businesses earlier on, the type of legal structures earlier on. So, what is the difference between a company and a business name? A company and a business name, as explained earlier, um, a company has a more elaborate structure. It has a board structure. You have shareholders. And then um, the tax requirement, um, like I said, you have a do double tax um, taxation line. You have the company income tax. You have the personal income tax for shareholders. Um, for business name, and then in terms of liability, I think that is where the difference lies most. Okay. A limited liability company, the liability of the shareholders are separate from the liability of the business itself. So the shareholder is shielded from any claim. Okay. If you, ha business. if you are a shareholder, yes. If you are a shareholder in a business and there's a claim against you, the claim cannot attach the business, because the business will come and say, sorry, um, you are having this claim against BK, you have a judgment against BK, and you are coming to attach our business, this account, our GTB, sorry, the account is a business account. It belongs to XYZ Limited Liability Company. So you can't do that. For a business name, like I said, um, business name, when we say business name, it's actually a pseudo name for your business. If not, you can just run your business from home or something, I can decide to register um, Florence Enterprises. That's a pseudo name. I can register Lex Hint. It's a pseudo business name. But when you unveil, I'm the only business owner there. It's the structure. There's no boss structure. There's no um, shareholder. Everything revolves around me. I'm the one trading in the name and style of whatever Florence Enterprises. So everything is still Florence. The only okay. advantage is, okay, I have a legal structure that enables me to open an account, a business account, and deal with customers, investors in a legal structure. Okay. 
I and in terms of the ability, everything rests on me. Anybody can attach my business and say I'm the one because I'm going into a transaction, I'm going into a transaction as me trading in the name and style of that business name. So there's no so distinction. There's no so there's no veil. There's no veil when it's a business name, but there's a veil there's no, when, there's it's, no... um, so when yeah. it's a company, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Money King, for, for popping in. I hope you're not popping in. I hope you're staying. He's a finance guru as well. Uh, Madam Florence, I don't want to forget this question because it's not part of the original list. Someone is asking, what is the difference between LIRS and FIRS? You know, when you're talking about the tax compliance and the registrations they should do, um, while I'm at it, can um, all those that put questions in the chat box, please put them in the question box because the comments are rolling by and um, might, um, I won't be able to go back to your questions. And we'll just be wrapping up very soon so that I can start taking the questions in the question box. So yes, somebody had popped that and I wrote it and I don't want to forget it. Thank you, sir. Okay, F FIRS, Federal Inland Revenue Service. Mm -hmm. And it um, regulates um, a companies, a limited liability companies, primarily federal um, businesses, federally regulated and businesses. Um, LIRS is for that is Lagos Inland Revenue Service. I actually said IRS, Inland Revenue Service, because for Abuja it will be not L, for Ogun State it will be uh, something else, maybe OIRS or something. So LIRS is Lagos Inland Revenue Service, and each state of the federation have their respective inland revenue service. And then okay, for so inland revenue service for businesses, they, um, they regulate personal income tax of employees and for everybody. Because even if you are not in employment, you are expected to remit your income tax. If you are not in employment, that goes to direct access. That's not within the purview of our discussion, but I think I've explained the difference. Yeah, indeed. I just realized that I wasn't being too fair to you because even though I look up to you for many things when it comes to these things, but I, after popping the question, I now realize that, look, this lady is a lawyer and you're asking her a tax consultant. No, 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 it's okay. Well, you've it's okay. Me very well. Thank you. I have here. I hope that you can answer it as much as you can because I know you're not a banker. But um, it says, um, I'm running a thriving business. I'm the only signatory to the business account. What happens in case of death? Who will the banks recognize? Can the deceased husband or daughter just go and want to make a claim on the business account? So proprietorship business and the business owner dies. That is the end of that business. There's no continuity. And again, that's the advantage of having a limited liability company because you have other shareholders to carry on. Um, what will happen is transmission of shares of the disease to. So the sole signatory is dead. Um, nothing happens until the letters of administration are obtained unless there's a will under which um, the deceased must have stated what should happen to that business. But it will still go through the probate anyway, whether letters of administration or will, until the grant of probate is done, obtained in case of a will, or letters of administration obtained, there's no representative to deal with the bank. So the bank will not attend to anybody. The account will remain as is until the proper legal documentation providing the names of the representatives are, uh, are submitted to the bank. The estate of the deceased are submitted to the bank. Thank you very much. Yeah. I wanted to put that on the table because many of us are running businesses. Well, I'm not doing that. But many people are running businesses and they are the sole signatories to the um, business accounts, you know. Uh, and it's such a dangerous thing to do. It's you know it's fifty fifty. Sometimes you don't want people you don't um, you don't want people you don't trust to, you know to to run the business. So one just has to find a balance. And that, I think I'm going to stop there and go quickly to estate planning so that we can take some questions. That's just the right uh, the right uh, time to stop and go quickly to um, estate planning. Um, I have seven questions here. I don't know if we can 
deal with it. I think I should just go straight to um, the one that says, why should I plan my estate? So I asked you a question and your answer is, if, you know, a sole signatory dies until the beneficiaries of the estate of the deceased or whichever, whatever legal document is available, the bank is not going to talk to anybody. So can, uh, I want you to help us understand why we need to, you know, have a will in place, why we need to plan our estates. You know what I mean? Just to help my followers understand the risk that they, they, they stand to face if they decide to do things alone and then don't put a proper, um, they don't put proper instru instructions in place, yes, for life af after now. After life. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, just briefly, um, when we say estate planning, we are looking at all that activities around um, putting structures in place for management and preservation of our assets, our businesses, our wealth, and even much more. Instructions as to what to want happen um, in case we are incapacitated or things go south and you are not able to deal with issues. And finally, in case the inevitable happens, being death, we always um, shy away from it. We don't want to talk about it, but it comes to all yeah. of us and nobody fixes yeah. an appointment anyway with that. So that is what um, estate planning is all about. And there are different tools for estate planning. It can be by will you can it can be by gifts it can be by trust it's quite detailed so we are not going into details um, and for all of them they have their advantages but generally estate planning helps you to put your house in order in fact starting with the idea of estate planning it means you are doing what we call a personal audit of your assets your portfolios where are they located what am I going to do with them? Which one of them is thriving now? Where do I own shares? What am I doing with my business? Are they registered? It comes back to that. That is when you begin to think that, oh, this business is not registered. So what happens in case of anything? You begin to look at that. You have to with personal audit, first line, preliminary um, benefits. Then estate planning helps you to determine what should happen. You are in control. You are able to assess and say, okay, in case I have this business, in case anything happens to me, like we are talking about the signature to account and all of that, this is the person I want to step into my shoes and speak on my behalf and act on my behalf. You are able to allocate your resources, your wealth, to the people that you think they are deserving. You are able to set up a structure that is not controlled by third parties when either you are incapacitated, you are no longer able to handle things yourself. And I try to stretch it at times to take it out of the scope of that or incapacity. As simple as you are running a business and you are the sole signatory, you are out of jurisdiction. Thank God for technology. You are expected to do something. You are not within jurisdiction. What happens to that business? You have a major contract on the line. You were discussing, you didn't know it will happen in your absence, and all of a sudden they need a representative of your business to come and close out. What happens? That is all about estate planning. Um, through estate planning, you can also remove some unfavorable rules of, um, around inheritance. Mm -hmm. We have situations where in some um, jurisdictions, Females are not allowed to inherit. We have in some jurisdictions, the, the firstborn male are the ones that are to inherit or take over the house where the deceased died, lived and died. You don't do, plan your estate. There's a tendency that in case of death, government takes, takes over to determine how your assets or your wealth, hard end wealth, is to be distributed. It saves time and all the issues around the uncertainty that, okay, you didn't make a will, you didn't leave any instructions, and then um, what would I have been thinking? 
Take yeah. your money because the, the government will take a percentage of whatever is left if you die. You Ex exactly. Talking exactly. My when my dad passed. Yeah. Yes. Estate planning also helps with wealth preservation, especially when you are using the tool of um, uh, the, uh, trust. You are able to, because for trust, like I said, we are discussing a lot of things here today. Um, trust, you are able to move certain businesses, transfer it from you to a third party to hold in trust, either for you to benefit throughout your lifetime or for the benefit of others. It helps you to even um, grow your wealth because you move, um, you plan very well. Like I said, you are able to understand that this stock that is lying here, I think I should dispose of them and invest in another business. So I think it's a so whole lot of things. It's quite detailed. Now, right? you're, you're talking yeah. about the benefit of having a trust over as, uh, me, right? as a tool so for so estate so planning. Also a tool to grow your wealth and to fund your um, finances, right? Exactly. Um, Florence, somebody just posted a question uh, because we're now in estate planning. I want us to quickly deal with it. You know the question about uh, somebody running a business and and and. I've been the only signatory and dying. Um, one of my followers, who is also a professional accountant, just posted a question and said, or a comment and said, what if the person sets up a mandate that is A and B and, so, and says, you know, either to sign? In that case, it's not a sole signatory. That's, that's the comment I want to pass. Is there yeah, a, it's not a sole signatory. If that is A or B, then it, it solves it. So maybe his suggestion is that you can also have that as a way of making sure that um, you know the business can keep running uh, in case of uh, in case things go down south, like you used in the language you used. Um, thank you, Florence. There are so many questions, and that's always the challenge. But I like the sessions. Who is frozen now? Is it me? Okay, I like the sessions because okay. it just gets us to ask more, more questions. Okay, uh, I'm going to put two questions together now because I want people to hear you the professional lawyer and side. I know we have, you know, put tutorials on this out before, but I want them to hear from your mouth. Now, the question is, do I need a lot of money to put a will in place? And at what age can I make my first will? Is making a will dependent on attaining any particular age? So two questions in one. What age can I make my first will? Do I need a lot of money to put a will in place? Um, the testamentary age in Nigeria is 18. Once you attain the age of 18 and above, you can make a will. And um, generally in this climb, like we've said over and over again, um, people are worried. So even if we are 17, 90, there's a tendency not to be um, um, willing or how do I put it? thinking of making a will because um, putting the will together for some people die. means they are going to die. But from 18 mm -hmm. and above, you can make a will. And um, generally, once you start, you get to that stage, even if it is, no matter how little the assets may be, and you can even make a will that takes care of the future, re your residual estates. You can have just one or two that are documented the advantage of having a will is for those that are not um, present at the moment, they fall into your residual estate that in case of death, even if it is not recorded, it's taken as part of your residual estate and your executors will deal with it in accordance with um, your instructions. Well, it's not yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. So anybody above age 18, is that what you said? Yes, above age 18. Above age 18, 18 and above, yeah. Must be 18 years of age and above. Okay. Um, yeah. There's one funny question here. It says, I have gifted an asset to a beneficiary. Do I need to include this in my will? So my father um, has given me a house before he died. Does he need to include that house in his will again? No, he does not need to include it in his will. But you have to be sure that the gift is valid. That is, there must be an intention. Um, the gift, the house was properly vested in you. And when you say house, it means the title registered with the appropriate land registry. 
So everything, I mean, the transfer of title to you is complete. But if title is not perfected, then it falls in back into the estate. You have it. Everybody will understand that you are gifted the property, but for them to be able to, uh, for the executors or the administrators to be able to transfer that, vest the house in you, it has to be covered by the letters of administration or the will. So if it was, it was not perfected, it would be advisable to have it in the will. And generally, you can always amend your will. So you can gift um, an asset, but um, you are preparing a will today, include it in that will, but just make a note somewhere that I need to review this as soon as um, the, the, the gift is perfected. So it take, comes off the will. If it's perfected, you don't need to include it in the will. So uh, thank you very much, Florian. So um, I, uh, there's a, no, I think I'll take that offline. I'll take that offline. Um, so what I just wanted you to speak to is, uh, you know, we have the, there's this general apathy. People don't want to write their wills. You already talked about that. And then when some people even get around to writing their wills, they're not writing or making smart wills. You know, uh, you are the expert here. One of the reasons I asked that other question um, is because of a real life experience of someone who had bequeathed or who had gifted, not bequeathed, who had gifted a, a house with all the legal documents and everything to a child and then still went and listed it as part of his estate. So can you tell us three things to, to or one or two things to note to make smart wheels? Uh, and uh, while you're at it, I thank you, you've mentioned it. I want my followers to know that when you put a wheel in place, it doesn't mean you're going to die. It just means that you're being very smart. You're being very smart to make sure that your loved ones don't um, begin to fight themselves after your demise. It also means that you're, being, trying to, you're, you're planning your um, estate very well so that you don't pay unnecessary, uh, your, your beneficiaries don't pay unnecessary um, fees to the government. And then also the, all the emotional issues involved when you're going from place to place trying to list your assets. Madam Florence, when she started talking about wills, she said, you know, one of the good things about that is that you can put all your properties together, you can list and know what you have and what you don't have. So quickly, man, do you want to please tell us how to do smart wills? One or two things? Okay, um, I, I think I, I started to start yeah. with the will, you have to identify your assets, the locations, okay. which states are they located, jurisdiction, what laws govern the, 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 the place where the assets are located. You have to look at all of that. And um, which asset do you want to go to? Who, how do you want to deal with them? Then um, you've done all of that. You, you, you've so taken notes. One. A comprehensive list of all your assets. Yes. Two, understanding understanding the legal what's the word now? The legal what is the, the location there about? The the legal requirements of the location of where the properties are located. Okay. Two, yeah. There's a question you must deal with before our time goes off. Uh, please, in case I forget, it's about uh, next of kin and beneficiary. Okay. So we're continuing with smart wheels. So the first is okay. to make sure that you list all your assets. The second is that you must understand the legal requirements of where your assets are domiciled, right? Located. That's yeah. Two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, then um, you now understand how you want to distribute um, your assets. And for those that are not listed, that are not in existence, now you have to take care of them. And that goes into the residual estate. How do you want to share them amongst your beneficiaries? Do you want to do them uh, share equally or percent uh, whatever it is? You have to, the instructions okay. have to be very, very clear and certain. Um, you, you do that, and then in drafting the will, for a will to be valid, one, it must be in writing. Okay. And um, the, the, the testator or the will maker must sign the will in the presence of two witnesses. And the two witnesses under the Nigerian law signing in the presence of each other. So it's not a case that oh. I, I prepare a will and I send it to Biodun to 
execute as to, um, sign. As, as to sign as a witness. The other sends it to Rebecca in another location. Everything must happen simultaneously. I'm executing the, the will. Must be, must be together and they are signing in the presence of each other. It's very, very important. Then the age, I think we've dealt with that. The person must be yeah, 18 it. years and above. And must be of the right mental capacity. Because a will can be voided. It can be taken as being not valid. If it can be proven that at the time the person was making the will, the person did not have the mental capacity to execute the will. So he didn't even know what he was doing. He must not be yeah. under any undue influence. Yeah. in making Thank the wheel. <laughs> We're running out of time. Thank you very much. The questions I put out are very deliberate. Um, it's because I want people to, you know, go probe further and, you know, ask more questions and try and have an understanding around these numerous issues. Um, yes, uh, Dr. T, thank you for that question. She had said, you know, with all that we're talking about, what then is the relevance of next of kin? But I did have that question. It's just that I, I couldn't ask you all. I needed to choose the ones I would uh, ask you. So I have a question that says, is my next of kin the same as the beneficiary of my will? Which I think is also the same question that Dr. T was asking or has asked in the, in the question. Box. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that confusion is um, common even amongst the most educated it confuses I tell you, it a lot. You are the one that made yeah. me understand it. You made me understand it. <laughs> it, it confuses it a lot. Be like it's my net, and it even causes um, sibling rivalries. My father made her the nurse of kin. Why should he do that? Is it that giving her power? Who is she to do that? And you start fighting unnecessary <laughs> fights. Please tell us about it. I <laughs> okay, it's 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 not the same thing. Although a nurse of kin may be a beneficiary of an estate, but not necessarily that it's a nurse of kin and automatically becomes the sole uh, inher um, inheritor of whatever it is, the estate. The nurse of kin generally is maybe a blood relation, a friend, an associate, my colleague at work, that I know that if anything happens to me today and they put a call to BK, BK will answer promptly and take actions to inform my relations to inform everybody around me that this is what has happened to florence that is all it has nothing yeah. to do with inheritance so you have you are appointed a nurse of king maybe um you, you are an employee for and you leave somebody as yes for, for, for just for, for for contact purposes for inheritance, that was how you broke it down at the session I, I heard you talk at. That, that was the first time I really had the you know full understanding. So what yeah. you're saying, Florence, is that the next of kin is not the beneficiary of the estate it's not, of the deceased. It's not. It's just a person that maybe some official or some companies can contact, you know, to reach out to the family or something. So it's not yeah, it's completely different from the beneficiary. Uh, absolutely uh, absolutely four I, I, oh, four minutes more and um, um, Instagram has a way of cutting off at exactly one hour I don't know if that has changed but that's what they always do uh, I think before I go on if I still have time to say anything I just want to thank you Florence I thank you for your time I know you're very busy I thank you for taking out time to speak with us this evening uh, some of the questions have been well answered and people understand. Some of them I didn't put to you, and so I would reach out to you and get answers for them. There are people I know. Tunji, I'm sorry, I you know, you know where to get to you. That's why I didn't put your question out there. I know I can always get to you. So there are so, so many questions, but I know the people and I can, and I can well. you know, get answers from you to them. Uh, you Very said well. already it's not expensive to have uh, incorporation. And Madam Florence had a promise, she had a package, but I told her it's not for this show. She had an offer, <laughs> a free, an offer of free service, uh, but I said not for today because um, I want to make sure that the, the right people uh, benefit, benefit from it. Uh, <laughs> yes, from it. So thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, uh, for those that laughed at me when Nepal took light, God knows you are <laughs> For those that genuinely sympathize, 
<laughs> I say thank you. <laughs> because I could see some comments in the comment place. But I'm glad that you all know what's happening in Nigeria. Uh, but the lesson taken, I would have power standby next time. Thank you very much, Madam Florence. Uh, the questions, thank I you. try and uh, share the responses on, on our page. Um, I think a question is coming up, but we have only three minutes. I can't take it. So I'll try and share the responses uh, in ways they can understand. Uh, the one about... Um, the one about uh, the cost. Okay. <laughs> okay. If you can talk about this one before we shut down, somebody is saying, why do companies then pay uh, benefits to next of kin if we say it's not um, uh, the beneficiary of the estate? I, I hope we have time. Um, if you if you check or probe for that, they are not paying to next of kin for especially the multinational companies. When you are filling, there's a form, a data you submit, naming your beneficiary. So when um, the employee passes, what happens is the beneficiary listed in that information um, form is entitled to benefits accruing from the death benefits and other things that may come up. Not necessarily because the person is a nurse or king, but it's listed as a beneficiary. So if you check, the, the company is not paying because the person is a nest of kin, but it's listed as a beneficiary of a certain amount. Amount. So probably the person yeah. is listed as next of kin and also listed as beneficiary. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Well, I, I, would, I would come to you, Florence, to get, because um, you know, it's one of my professional colleagues that asked that question. So uh, I can get more uh, details, and then if he has further questions, I can... I, we, you know, I can come to you so we can really trash it out. Thank you so no, much. No problem. Uh, okay, thank you. Too. I'm really grateful. Thank you, everyone that joined. Jerry Temple, thank you. I don't know if you were laughing with me or laughing at me, but thank you. <laughs> uh, I also thank you. Antibola, thank you for joining. Uh, Miami Blessing, thank you. Uh, Rafi Ruffles, thank you very much. Sunji, I will get to you. I owe you so many things. I'll get to you. Um, yeah, Funky Farms, thank you very much. Thank you so, so much. Auntie Rose, thank you. Dr. T, you always join us. Thank you so much. I don't know if Dr. King is still around, but he's a renowned finance coach. Thank you for joining. Titi Jewels from Abuja, thank you so much. Uh, yes, Claire Zobel, thank you. Dr. Dr. Awolo, thank you very much for joining. I hope you're still here. All right. Thank you, everybody. Ola Bean, good to see you. Uh, Edison Aguera, good to see you. Obi-127, thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope I bring an interesting guest again to you next month. Thank you very much. Have a good evening and a beautiful week. Thank you, Florence. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye, Florence. Thank you.